nobody who's come as a citizen to speak before the Conservation Commission tonight. And I don't see anyone signing on. So I am gonna assume at this point there is nobody. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on. Now, we have quite a few things on our agenda. Um, our first item is we are going to have a guest speaker. Um, Brian Groshen is joining us from um, Casella. Um, Brian is a uh, regional manager, is that correct? Is that the correct title, Brian? Yeah, I'm a market area manager for Casella. I manage um, Southern New Hampshire and Northeastern Massachusetts for the company. And for those of you that don't know, Casella is, um, if you put your recycling and trash out on the curbside in Newmarket with your Newmarket trash bag and your Newmarket uh, recycling bin, they're the service that comes and picks up those items. And Brian is here tonight to talk to us about recycling. So I'm gonna give Brian the floor at this point. Well, I appreciate you having me and, and giving me the opportunity to speak with everybody tonight. Um, over the last three years, there's been a significant change in the recycling market. Um, and unfortunately, when change occurs, there's a lot of misnomers that get out there as well on what is ultimately happening to uh, recycling that's placed at the curb. So before I kind of get started on the recycling piece, I'll just kind of tell you a little bit about the organization that supports the town of Newmarket. So Casella is a regionally based company, mostly located within the Northeast from a hauling standpoint where we actually put trucks on the road, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, and New York primarily. We do some other entities within our business that we actually have representation uh, throughout the company where we have small teams that insert themselves into manufacturing plants to help them manage the waste that is produced through their production processes. Um, so for my little corner of the world, I'm responsible for the hauling and transfer of material <clears throat> uh, from basically Plymouth, New Hampshire south and east um, to the main border, um, as well as uh, within Northeastern Massachusetts, basically the 495 corridor from Westford, Mass, Newburyport, Massachusetts. Um, as stated uh, by Patrick, when we started, um, we provide curbside collection in the town of Newmarket. Um, we provide weekly collection of trash and recycling. So to get started on recycling, so back in 2017, China initiated um, a program called National Sword, which banned the imports of mixed fiber, um, which is from a ratio standpoint is the largest percentage of material that we actually recycle. And we consider mixed fiber like um, newsletters, um, wasted mail, um, just different mixes of paper outside of box board and cardboard. Um, so China banned that. And again, that was about 65% of the material that we uh, recycle. And then for all the other material that um, we accept in our recycle stream, um, they, were, they changed the amount of contamination, which is the amount of material within a baled, um, you know, a baled piece of plastic or tin or aluminum. They changed it from 3% acceptable contamination down to a half a percent. Those changes, because we as a country as a whole exported a majority of our recycled materials there um, and it created a huge, dis huge disruption. So ultimately we had to find new outlets for material. Um, we had to slow down our production lines to uh, achieve the uh, quality of material that was expected uh, for it to arrive in China. Um, had to add more quality control mechanisms in place um, to again, help provide a better quality. Ultimately, that caused commodity values to fall and the cost to process the material to increase. Um, and it really created a situation where <clears throat> municipalities uh, were considering eliminating the program because of the cost associated with it. Um, so I'll kind of start there with, a, with a, what happened in the recycling market. Now I'll tell you about how 
that the material is processed within your community. So a resident in New Market places their material at the curb. We collected um, our You're on mute, Brian. Yeah, sorry oh, about that. Um, your material is collected on Monday and Tuesdays and Wednesdays. The, the recycling that's collected is picked up and then transported to our transfer station that's located in Allenstown, New Hampshire. It's offloaded off the route trucks and then reloaded with other recycled material that's collected from other communities within New Hampshire and loaded into a tractor and trailer and then transported to our material recovery facility located in Charleston, Massachusetts. At that point, it goes through a mechanical separation process with the assistance of some labor across the, the line um, to separate out the individual commodities. Uh, the primary ones are, as I just stated, mixed fiber, which is your mixed paper and et cetera, cardboard, tin, aluminum, and plastics. Um, those materials are then isolated into their own individual commodity. They are then bailed and then shipped off to their end site. So within Casella, um, once that disruption occurred, we obviously needed to look at our, our buyers of the commodities. Um, and the company worked really, really hard to find domestic markets for our material. Um, with the China ban, what was basically happening is if your material didn't achieve the quality that was set forth, that material would have been reloaded onto a ship is typically how we would send it to China and then sent back which would have a huge cost impact to us. So we really worked hard to find domestic outlets. Um, I did send uh, to Wendy a Q&A um, that talks um, about the different um, markets that the material uh, Casella sends to. And like I said, a majority of it is now domestic. Um, the company also invested uh, last year over $10 million in our infrastructure. Um, to improve the mechanical process of the material separation. Again, the goal to improve the quality of the material. Um, so with all that being done, finding domestic markets, improving our infrastructure, we've actually seen a significant rebound in the value of our commodities that we pick up within your community. And <clears throat> the way the disposal pricing works for most communities, it's a formula basis. As I stated before, there's a cost to, you know, we have to transport the material and then we have to process it. There's a cost associated with that. But there's also a value to the material that you're bringing to us. And we call that the average commodity revenue, which is basically the average value of all the materials that you bring to us. So you take your um, processing and trans costs and then you subtract out of it the value of those materials. When China happened, um, you would consider that uh, basically your, your cost to dispose, process, um, and transport that material was almost double what you would pay to dispose of your trash. Um, and that's why it really left it open to communities like yourselves between town councils um, and select boards to discuss whether or not they would want to continue to have the program or not. I'm happy to say that with the changes that Casella has been able to make, the cost is almost equal at this point. Basically the cost of disposal of recycle, depending on your community and your disposal agreements for a municipal solid waste, uh, which uh, the town of Newmarket uh, belongs to the Lamprey district, district and your waste ends up, uh, trash goes to Turnkey Landfill in Rochester. Your disposal cost for trash <clears throat> and your disposal costs for recycling as of today are just about equal, where about two years ago, the cost to dispose of recycling was almost double. So we've seen a significant rebound. It's a commodity and commodity values fluctuate, but we really feel like the changes that we've made within our organization, we're able to bring value back to communities. And at the end of the day, divert material from either going to a landfill or an incinerator. And that, you know, that's one of the goals here. So that's, uh, that's the overview of what's going on with recycling. Um, and again, um, another document that I had sent, um, like I said, because of 
the huge changes that happen in the recycle market. There are a lot of um, uh, potential community members that, that thought that we were just tossing everything into the trash, which was not true. Everything that can be recycled, that's everything that is placed at the curb to be recycled and is accepted in our recycling stream is recycled and always has been. It's just the value of that material has obviously fluctuated quite significantly over the past three years. So, um, so the, the other document that I'd send, I'm not sure if you have received it yet, but I would be happy to um, also drop off some hard copies to the town are some myths and facts regarding recycling. So um, hopefully everybody will find those useful. Um, but at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to take any questions that anybody might have at this point. I actually have a question, Brian. Um, I live in Newmarket, but I work in like right on the Greenland Stratum town line. And I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, but maybe. Uh, recently, Stratum residents got um, rolling covered recycle bins from Casella. Um, they went from the open, the small open bins to the covered ones. And I just was curious. Um, I hadn't reached out yet to the Stratum um, town council or conservation commission or anything. I didn't know if the town footed that bill or the residents or if there was some sort of agreement. I don't know if you know anything about that. Yeah, no, I appreciate you asking the question, Melissa. And um, yes, that was something that I was heavily involved with. So um, just to give you a little bit of history on that, the solid waste contract that the town of Newmarket, um, a couple of years ago, or last three years ago, uh, the town of Newmarket, Newfield and Stratum, they would put all their collection, um, their collection contract went out to bid collectively. So if I was a hauler, Casella, I was bidding on not only the town of Newmarket, but the town of Stratum and Newfield at the same time. That can, and it was the, the, basically the purpose of that was those three communities, including your, the town of Newmarket, thought that if we all three go out to bid together, we will, um, from an economy of scale standpoint, we'll be able to get a more competitive rate, ultimately bringing savings to the community members. Over time though, the current mode of collection in Newmarket is manual collection, which means that I have a driver and a laborer on the back of the truck that actually physically picks up the material at the curb. The cost of that mode of collection is increasing significantly and has been over recent years, a lot due to the ability to find labor. It's a very tough labor market. The cost of insurance, the cost of workers comp, and the probability of injury doing that. It's a very, it's one of the riskier types of jobs that you can have out there. Unfortunately, <laughs> Um, our business and within our company has experienced fatalities with individuals performing that type of work. So Casella as a whole has been pushing really hard to try to get away from that type of service offering and working with different communities to transition the mode of collection from manual to, uh, to an automated. And with an automated collection, it's only one employee who's positioned in the front right corner of our truck um, and utilizes a mechanical arm um, to pick up the trash and recycling that's placed at the curb. And that, that material is placed inside these specific parts. So that's a little bit back, back history. So the town of Stratum recognized, you know, and, and uh, felt like they wanted to start to move in the, the mode of automated collection as a control mechanism for the cost of collection. Um, so they had um, put out a RFP last year um, to um, automate the town, at which point Casella, among some other haulers, uh, placed proposals uh, for automated collection. Uh, Casella uh, was fortunate enough to provide the town a, um, the most competitive rate, a rate that was lower than their current cost of collection. So they were able to find some savings there. We also, and I worked with <clears throat> a group, a nonprofit organization called the Recycling Partnership that was able to provide grant funding to the town, which was the equivalent of about $48,000. Oh. Basically the, the, the grant um, provides, if, if your town is approved for the grant, um, each, um, they pay $15 for each household 
uh, within that community towards the purchase of the carts. Um, in this case, um, Casella provided the carts uh, to the town of Stratum. Um, so that was rolled into their overall cost. Um, and those carts, like I said, so it was another benefit to the town to offset the cost of collection because now they receive and will receive a rebate on their cost of collection for the next years. Um, they also, the grant also gives another $1 for every household for education purposes. So the town of Stratum is approximately 3,200 households that they receive another $3,200 in education funding. Um, the other uh, neat component to that that might be of interest to this group is uh, Casella worked with a company called ReRig Pacific that designs those automated collection carts. Those carts are designed of 40% post-consumer recyclables. So 40% of that cart is made of recycled material. And basically the way they do that is they create an out, outer and inner shell that's made of organic material, non-recycled items that create some real rigidity there. And then between it, uh, those two shells is where they inject the recycled material to provide the overall structural integrity of that cart. Um, so that's kind of a neat story and I like to tell um, because there is some value. Those carts, um, they come with 10 year warranties on them and typically will last 20 plus years. I mean, it's a, it's a cart system that we use all over our footprint. Um, so in addition to the cart and the automations and the savings that potentially provides the community, um, it also provides a way to also bring a cleaner product because you, you don't have to worry about plastic bags or putting it in a bagged item because um, we don't like to see plastic bags in the recycling. Um, it contains the recycling within that cart helps minimize um, debris um, being tossed around the town during mm -hmm. the day. So that's kind of a, a long-winded, like I said, I was heavily involved with that project um, and still very involved with the community, obviously. That's one of my um, contracts that I manage. Um, but um, it's also a, a pretty neat story how it ended up coming to fruition. Yeah, so I, I have actually read about that uh, grant before because I have a passion for litter and my screen <laughs> after collection is just ridiculous. Um, but it really, it comes down to the contract between whoever the waste collector is in the town and kind of how they want to do that, right? Because we couldn't have those carts now with manual collection. That is correct. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Great question. Uh, question, <clears throat> can you talk a little bit more about um, what we could do as individuals and as the Conservation Commission, as the community to make our recyclables um, better. Like I know you mentioned plastic bags, cause I see people, you know, they tie up there all the recyclables in plastic bags and put those in the bin. And I know that's that's not particularly effective, I think. So could you talk a little bit more about some things we could do better? Yeah, so Casella has kicked off a campaign called Recycle Better. And it's really kind of getting back to the basics. With the single stream, so we trademark it, we've trademarked our recycling program called zero, zero sort recycling. Within the industry, it's called single stream, basically meaning that all the material that we can recycle or that's accepted in our recycling program can all be tossed into one container and then separated at a material recovery facility through, again, mechanical separation as well as the assistance of labor. So what happens within those programs, and the reason that we've dubbed this Recycle Better campaign and get back to the basics is over time with this program, people start to get, and we within, within the industry, start to get a little creative on what we think is recyclable. And we call it kind of quote unquote, wishful recycling. Um, and so, for example, a lot of plastic items like film plastics, which would be the plastic grocery bags or the plastic trash bags. Those types of plastic are not accepted within the single stream, zero sort material. Um, it's rigid plastics. Um, and it's, we've gotten as simplistic as, it's a plastic with a neck on it. So a milk jug, a water bottle, et cetera, a laundry detergent bottle. Um, and the reason we've done that is because we felt that we've gotten a little too far, quote unquote, off the reservation 
um, and people were putting a lot of items that weren't acceptable in our stream. Um, and which ultimately leads to anything that we can't accept in our stream is considered contamination. And that contamination is then separated out um, and we then call it what we call residue. And that ultimately will either go to an incinerator or a landfill to be disposed of. Um, those are all costs that we incur. Unfortunately, when we incur costs, those costs are eventually passed on to the customer. Um, so education is number one, realizing and recognizing some of these, so plastic grocery bags, plastic trash bags aren't accepted within the zero sort stream. Um, you'll see for more often than not, when someone buys a new TV, they'll leave the styrofoam within the package, thinking that, hey, styrofoam's uh, accepted. Uh, styrofoam can be recycled. I believe California is the only one state in the country that actually has a formalized recycle program for styrofoam. Um, but um, clothing is another one. Again, clothing, there is a system to recycle clothing. Um, it is just unfortunately not through our program. Um, that, that goes for grocery bags as well, right? Uh, typically Market Basket and Hannaford, they have um, uh, disposal locations as you enter the their stores um, where you can um, dispose of those bags where they'll be recycled at a later point. Um, so I'd be more than happy to provide some literature of, and we really like to focus on the things that you can recycle instead of what you can't, mm -hmm. because the items that you can't is, can be quite large, uh, whereas the items that you can recycle is, is fairly limited at the end of the day. Um, but we do feel like, and as a company, as a whole and an industry, Feel like we get the largest participation through a single screen um, program versus a source separated program where you would actually physically at the curb separate out your cardboard tin aluminum plastics paper etc so can you uh, um what about glass yeah no great point um so i'm glad you brought up glass because um in parallel of the huge influx of china the only glass remanufacturing plant within New England shut down. Um, and when it goes through the process, through the zero sort process, it actually becomes crushed. So in some states like bottle bill states, like Maine, for example, they'll take those bottles at a, um, at a redemption center and then they actually they have the whole bottle that'll later be cleaned and then you know um, put back to use. Within our process, it gets crushed. And that crushed glass used to go to this manufacturing plant, like I said, in Massachusetts to be remanufactured in other glass products. That facility shut down. And because the glass is so heavy, it is extremely expensive to transport. Um, so Casella, when all this happened, um, crushed glass can also be used as an aggregate in construction applications. So we've been working with um, Harney Construction out of Boston and using it as in different aggregate applications during their construction processes. We've also been using it, um, Casella has a number of landfills across the state. Um, we've been using it as a uh, road base for the roads to uh, ingress and egress the landfills. Um, so we continue to reuse it. Unfortunately, it, uh, currently it is not being recycled into new glass products at this point. Um, some communities, I will add this final note, some communities because of the weight of glass and because where the cost of recycling had gone, you may have seen on the news that some uh, municipalities within New Hampshire uh, didn't want their residents to place their glass in recycling. They wanted it to place it in the trash because glass ultimately of the items we recycle is the heaviest product that we recycle. So they were trying to take advantage of that cost savings by having residents dispose of it in the trash. So I just bring that up because it was pretty mainstream media uh, about a year or so ago. Mm -hmm. I will say that um, uh, in calling around and getting guests for each of our meetings, Brian, you would get a blue ribbon for your enthusiasm when I first made the first couple of sentences about being a guest. Um, I, I thought it was very impressive that you said right away, yes, I can do that. And then talked a little bit more about what you'd like to present to us. That's, that's really, really a great reflection on you and your, your interest in recycling and your company. 
And Brian did forward several, um, he referred to them, the, um, I think he called it a myth buster sheet or something. There was a couple of fact sheets that he yeah. forwarded. I'll make sure that I get those. I'm not going to do it during our meeting, but I'll make sure that post meeting, I'll forward those to each of the conservation commission members. And like you say, Wendy has them as well, but I'll get them to each member so they can see the things that you've referred to during this presentation or during your, your, your talk with us as well. Any other other questions? Ellen's got something still for you, Brian. So um, yeah, I'm really interested in the recycle better because I it's sort of a pet peeve of mine that I look at what people put in the recycle bin and it doesn't yeah. some of it doesn't look recyclable. So what is the best way to reach our neighbors, our friends, our community? Is it through you doing it or we can somehow help get the word out? Yeah, so I think it's a little bit of everything. Um, I think, you know, unfortunately, because of the pandemic and, and like Chris was just mentioning, I got quite enthusiastic to present. Part of my job is to get out into the public, to get in front of your community members, you know, within your community, whether it's the Conservation Commission or other boards within the community, uh, to get out there and talk about what's going on within our industry. Um, because there is a lot going on and we want to keep everybody well informed. So. Between myself and public engagement, which I'm starting to go get a little more and more of over time as we start to get used to this quote unquote new normal, um, but as well as utilizing social media channels, um, uh, several municipalities, you know, we do quite a few, we actually have a video that discusses Recycle Better, talks a lot about what's going on within our industry. Um, it's about a three minute video um, it's really well done, um, and it, I think, provides a lot of answers that people ask. Mm. Um, we also utilize, you know, um, like I said, I sent a couple of um, um, kind of fact sheets, if you will, um, as well as we can also support and provide flyers at the town hall, um, you know, as people pick up their vehicle registration, there can be an eight and a half by 11 sheet on the do's and don'ts of recycling. Um, we have those products available, readily available mm. for, the, for the town to distribute um, and would be more than happy to provide those um, to the town as well. Um, so Our conservation commission is interesting because uh, as many in the states, but not every conservation commission, we have reps from the planning board and from the, the town council here. Yep. joining our, our meeting. So Megan Brabick is one of our town councilors. I don't know if she's still going to be our, our rep from the council when we reorganize. She's given it two thumbs up. I didn't think we were going to let her leave. So Megan would be a great liaison. And so Megan, um, we can make sure that you and Brian have your emails exchanged so that Brian, you can see how Megan can be a conduit for you to get more information to our town council. And yep. I don't think I'm speaking alone here and saying we'd love to have anything you can provide in the town hall as the, the hands-on takeaway pieces for people that go in and do town hall business. We also have the opportunity, I bet, to use your video with our um, channel 13, which is on here too. Tim Kremen does a great job of broadcasting and putting things on our town's closed circuit TV. So there would be another option and we're doing some work on our website coming up. So that'd be something that probably Ellen and our chair could work on uh, embedding a video or making a video link onto the website. So. Um, I think Casella probably has had a wonderful budget to make this video that you talk about or some of the flyers and handouts and whatnot that you talk about. So I think uh, I'm feeling pretty good that we'd like to, to work closely and get, I'm going to say get whatever we can out of you, but that might sound a bit rude. So what's the polite way to say that? Take advantage of your extensive marketing research or however you want to say that. <laughs> Yeah, no, we'd, uh, I'd be happy to, uh, like I said, provide those products to the town and, and provide as much information as possible. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> we appreciate you coming tonight. And I think uh, that was some good news. I'm, I'm happy to hear that uh, there's, that our materials are once again being recycled. So, so thank you. That was, that was some good news to hear. Um, We'll look forward to reviewing those materials and getting them out to the community in a variety of ways. So that's yep. also helpful. So thank you. Um, thank you. So here's what I'd like to do now. 
We're going to go on to the next item on our agenda, which is uh, a review of a permit um, for Grant Road. But before we do that, I would like to have Sue call the roll um, of who's here for uh, the commission tonight, since we will be reviewing a permit request here. So um, I'll let Sue have the floor. Uh, Patrick Reynolds. Present. Chris Blackstone. Here. David Bell. Here. Ellen Snyder. Here. Sam Kenny. Here. Melissa Sharples. Here. Megan Brayback. Here. Melissa Brogel. Here. Okay. So I believe um, representing this project tonight, we have uh, Jim Gove. Um, and I thought I saw Alex. Alex is here. Alex. Um, and um, your materials that you sent me, uh, Jim and Alex, I forwarded on to everybody here. So they've all seen a copy of that. Um, I do have the information as well. If there's something in particular you want me to share on the screen, I can do that. Um, typically, we wouldn't, you know, just go through page by page. We would just um, go to items that you have particularly want us to see. And then I can um, make sure everyone's looking at those. But it sounds like everybody I see looking down at their paper. So everybody I assume has a copy of it and can refer to it if you uh, want to reference a page or, or something like that. Okay. So um, let me kind of set the stage here. Um, this is a lot that's on 60 Grant Road and it's right next to the American Legion. Um, and it's a long, narrow lot, um, one side of which uh, is the Piscassic River. Now, originally, the intent uh, of my going out there and delineating uh, just a portion of the lot, which is a, a small isolated wetland right in the front, right next to Grant Road, was the fact that these folks were gonna put in a single house about 150 feet back from the road. Uh, and they were just gonna access out uh, onto Grant Road um, and have no wetland impact. So unfortunately, uh, it didn't work out that way. Uh, the uh, Department of Transportation reviewed the request uh, for a driveway permit. And when they reviewed that request, it turned out that there was a site distance issue. Uh, in other words, you're supposed to have, be able to see 400 feet in either direction to safely pull out onto a road, uh, in this case, Grant Road. Um, and uh, it turns out that there was less than 200 feet where uh, it was proposed so uh, James Hewitt with the Department of Transportation uh, basically has mandated that the driveway be moved down uh, to make that 400 feet uh, acceptable. Um, and what happens when you do that is you clip a corner of that isolated wetland. Now the isolated wetland is not a vernal pool, it's just a small forested wetland um, and is going to be 235 square feet of direct impact uh, to that isolated wetland. Um, and uh, obviously this was a surprise for the owner uh, because um, they thought they were going to be able to do everything that they wanted to do with just a simple building permit. Um, so anyway, um, we were asked then to put together the application for the dredge and fill. And there are plans in there from Beals Associates uh, that show the, uh, show the house, proposed house and the grading. One of the things I asked Beals was to say, well, look, could you possibly, to avoid a wetland impact? I mean, could you possibly put in a retaining wall, a small retaining wall? Well, it turns out even with a retaining wall, they still impacted it. So, uh, so unfortunately, um, the DOT is essentially forced 
uh, the landowner to getting this particular um, dredge and fill permit. So let me give you a couple of uh, details about this. Um, Jim, if, can I, can yes. I just interject sure. one thing? I do yeah. think it might be helpful. I'm just thinking for the public um, who might be watching. Let me just show, I do have a good picture. Um, let me just show this for a moment. Um, and so let me know if everyone can see this picture that I'm sharing. Um, yeah. Just so people know where this is. Um, I see. This is Grant Road. This is Hersey Lane right here. Um, this is the property that is being referred to as a Legion property. It's, it's owned by the Shanda family and it is used by the, the Legion as a uh, gathering spot. This is the this Cassock River right here. Um, and if you know this area, um, there's a rise right here, right? As, as you're going on Grant Road towards, towards town, towards the schools, there is a rise right in here. So I'm guessing that um, the driveway might have been originally almost across from Hersey Lane Correct. was the original idea. And now you're further downhill because really where your property line is almost is probably the top of that hill or very close to it. And that's where there's, as you come over this hill, it is dangerous. I mean, mm, I will yeah. say that I always worry about people walking because I live within a mile of this area. I worry about people walking here. I just wanted to, to offer that so people know exactly where this is. And you can see the outline of this is where the house I assume is proposed to be. Right. Um, this yeah. is the wet area right in here. Is that right? right. Correct. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll let you go back. I just wanted to make sure everybody uh, knew where we were talking about. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so, um, so what happened next was the fact that uh, we thought perhaps this could be an expedited application because it was essentially for a driveway. However, um, we also have the Piscassic River uh, that is um, uh, considered to be a, a significant area. And because of that, um, uh, that basically we have to go standard. So this is a standard application, even though it's only 235 square feet. Uh, we had an NHB hit uh, that uh, occurred. Um, in fact, a number of NHB hits, uh, and that NHB was 21-0967, and it's in the application. Um, and um, so uh, there were a number of species uh, that are in this area, as you pro folks probably already know. I mean, there's wood turtles, there's landings turtles. Um, there are a number of turtle species there. So um, we contacted both Natural Heritage Bureau and also Fish and Game. Um, and Amy Lamb worked with us on Natural Heritage Bureau and Kim Tuttle from Fish and Game worked with us. Um, and in essence, um, they were not that concerned about the actual location of the individual house. Uh, they were more concerned um, that a 100 foot uh, setback off the Piscassic River uh, be maintained. Uh, so if you take a look at the actual location of where the house is, um, you can see that there's, there's no, they aren't, they aren't anywhere near the Piscassic River. Um, and so that was, that was one of the things they said, well, because of where the house is located, we really have no concern as long as that 100 foot forested area maintains the Piscassic. Uh, the second thing was on the plans, and you, I don't know if you've seen the plans, you'll note that on some of the plans, we actually have pictures of some of the uh, threatened or endangered species there, uh, primarily because um, it's during construction, we want to make sure um, that any construction workers say, oh, okay, we'll recognize that, that we might have something here. 
And so um, the, the information uh, was put right on the plan and also brochures are gonna be provided uh, to the landowner uh, and to be provided to the contractors. Um, apparently because this is a, a very old lot, uh, 1965, it actually predates uh, the uh, uh, wetland buffers of both poorly drained and very poorly drained. So we've got a, a response from Diane Hardy, uh, who basically says, if you get your wetlands permit, you're fine. The town is not going to require uh, any additional permitting uh, for work in a buffer. Um, so, um, I think that kind of wraps it up. It's an unfortunate situation, but it, as, as Jim Hewitt from DOT uh, responded, uh, is basically says safety trumps wetlands. Um, and, um, and actually it's interesting, we actually in the application, we actually put in a case where, and not this one, where uh, DES did agree that, uh, that they had to have this impact because of safety issues. So, so in essence, uh, that's my that's my presentation. Are there any questions for Jim? Hi, this is this is Melissa. I have a question about um, it. Is that? What is out there as far as, um, it's my understanding that the, the ground out there is mostly granite. Is that, will there be a lot of blasting, anything like that? Uh, I, not where I did the test pits. Um, I, I didn't have any issue at all uh, getting um, good test pits. Now, I know that uh, as you move further back in the lot, uh, and the house is going to be more on kind of the, the front hill, uh, kind of sort of in the lower part of the front hill. Uh, and I didn't have any, uh, I didn't in, uh, have any ledge there. But, um, uh, but uh, as you move further back, I think it probably does uh, have bedrock uh, up on top of the hill as you move farther back. But that's not really where the house is located. So I don't think we're going to have an issue with ledge. I mean, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't have X-ray vision, even though I did the test pits out there. I, I don't have X-ray vision, but it it strikes me that based upon the topography, I think the house will be all right. Thank you. Um, not not really a question, more of a comment. But I also do a lot of work with DOT, and uh, your your experience sounds extremely familiar. They can be unyielding, to put it nicely. So I I understand the situation you're in, and can at least kind of provide that that context that that is the way they operate. Yeah. And. Uh... I'm going to ask this question because we don't really see too many requests that aren't expedited. So there isn't actually a, a request for us to sign off on this permit because it's not an expedited permit, correct? Well, typically what the, the DES looks for is a very simple letter uh, that just simply says, uh, uh, have no objection. In other words, you know, um, uh, when you sign off on the expedited application, then of course you're saying, well, okay, it looks good to us. Uh, where this is a standard, you don't really have to do that. Um, but the DES does like to have in their records uh, that you had no objection. So I'm not gonna ask you to write a letter that says, oh, this is glowingly wonderful. And, and uh, it, you know, this is the, best application we've ever seen or something like that. That's, that's, that, no, that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is to have just a simple letter to DES saying we have no objection. Okay. Is there any other questions from any other members? I just had a question. Um, I don't know if you can answer it, but I know there are other lots that are similar, right? That parallel that. So 
I just yeah, wondered, that may... now, would it be possible if these people sold the back that somehow development could occur back there? Or what, what do you think about that? Well, I, okay, I'd be selling landlocked parcel, in other words, and I, I don't know how that transfer would work because um, uh, typically um, if you subdivide something, you can't make it uh, a landlocked parcel. And I think I'm going to ask Alex if, if I'm correct in this interpretation that you really can't, uh, I mean, I guess you could do a lot line adjustment maybe to take some of that back land, but I don't see any subdivision potential here. But Alex, what do you think? Yeah, that's right, Jim. And I think Ellen's question is there's pieces next door that look very similar to this. They're long and narrow like this and they have similar terrain to this. Could the people next door buy a portion of this back land and put a subdivision in? I can't say that that's impossible to do, but I can say that the topography out there, um, the parcel next door, as Patrick mentioned, is kind of as you go up the hill and that parcel is primarily ledge. Um, the back of this parcel is primarily ledge. So um, with the price of homes the way they are uh, right now, who knows, but um, to, to develop the parcel next door, you would do a lot line adjustment with this parcel. You could probably get a little bit of land, um, but it would be at this point infeasible to develop that. Um, that's you know certainly not on the table with the current owner, just looking to put one house in. The total, the total lot size for this one parcel is around 10, 10 and a half acres. Is that correct? Yeah, 10 uh, yeah. and a half acres. Right. Yep. Right. Right. And it, it borders along the Pocasset River and between the river, the, there's an actual kind of swale that runs at the bottom there. There's the river bank and then it drops down on the other side of that quite significantly. And then it kind of rises back up because I've, I've actually walked that property before it was sold um, with the permission of the landowner. Um, and um, so I, I, it's, it's some very uneven terrain in there. Um, you, you, you did include it uh, at a topographic map that kind of shows that. Um, but yeah, I would be hard pressed to see how that they could develop that back part because of that. Um, okay, well, um, I think at this point then, uh, what I would ask is um, that everybody um, might circle back and make sure they've had a good chance to review. If there's no other questions, um, then we would probably, um, uh, you know, make a vote on whether we would want to write a letter in support of this project. Um, just want to make sure there's no other questions, because this is our opportunity to do that. I think they've done a good job of um, placing the house pretty close to Grant Road, and I like the education that they're proposing with the landowner and the contractor, so I think we could put that in the letter and they're protecting really the whole northern two thirds that are along the river. So seems to be about the best spot for a house. And I did look at the wetland. It is. It just seems like the water just running off the hill and settling in that little depression there. So it's it. I mean, all wetlands are nice, but it is a pretty minor impact, at least that I could tell. Okay. Thanks, Alan. That's helpful. So if you want that as a motion, I'd be happy to make that as a motion. Okay. Is there a second on the motion to write that letter? I Chris? still will second. Okay. We'll go ahead and hold the vote. Chris, you want to call a roll for the vote? Sue, <laughs> Sue calls the roll. I say I can do that, but Oh, Sue's I'm sorry, right Sue. There. I meant to say Sue. I was looking. <laughs> I needed more warning. Okay. There, there will be uh, there will be one, two, three, four, five, six voting people. Patrick Reynolds. Aye. Chris Blackstone. Yes. David Bell. David. 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 Oh, aye. Um, Sam Kenny. Aye. Did I already say Ellen? Aye. And Melissa Sharples. 
Aye. Six okay. zero zero. So we'll put together that letter and send that off and we'll copy you and uh, everyone else on the application. Thank, Thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys for uh, sitting through our recycling before we got to you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Actually, you learned something about recycling. Well, uh, since I'm a new market resident, I, I was kind of interested in it. So oh, I, good. I, yeah. I liked it. I actually was interested in that. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yep. Bye bye. All right. Well, I see our our next participants are here. Uh, that's John Martin, and uh, that's great. So we're moving right along. John is here to talk about the Heron Point Management Plan. Um. So I will. Give the floor to John. Hi there. How are you all? Good. How are you? Uh, good. This I, this is my official third Zoom meeting for business. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten pretty lucky and been able to stay in the woods most of this time. Well, welcome. So I'm a bit I'm a bit uh, catching up on the curve of how to use Zoom. So forgive me if I have any technical difficulties. Okay. If there's anything Happens you want, to the best of if you if there's anything you want me to share, do you want me to share the document that um, Alan prepared, or is there the any articles in objectives form? That would be great. Yeah. Okay. I will so do maybe I should maybe I should start since I um, uh, little background. So as you recall, we hired John and his. Um, Assistant Greg, who is, does a lot of the recreation work, I think, for John. And they've been out, both of them, I think, have been out to the site. And uh, I went out with Greg and showed him the existing trail and where we had talked about maybe a new trail. And then he spent some more time out there, I believe. And then John sent us a sort of a standard landowner objectives uh, form that I filled out. Patrick looked at it. It kind of applies to sort of private landowners, but we filled it in for Heron Point. So we wanted to bring that forward to the group to make sure, you know, if you had any ideas or changes and John can go through that with the group and anything else he's found so far. Yeah, so I received the goals and objectives. I took a quick spin through it and you're right, it isn't a hundred percent applicable to publicly owned land, but it's kind of what we had to work with. So I thought it might be a good place to start at least. Um, I did perform a timber cruise out there um, back when, well, it looks like I did it uh, the beginning of March, uh, still a little bit of ice and snow out there. So, but was able to see a lot of the bare ground and things like that. Um, wanted to do that just at least to have a basis to start for mapping and also for um, just to get you some um, estimated volumes on the property of what was growing. And so we can keep track of that over the long term. Um, I'm just going through the cruise notes right now. And um, basically we had uh, two cruise um, stands, two timber type stands. Um, I'll hold the map up a little crude, but um, I don't know if you can read that, but you can kind of see the property in the inventory and everything like that. So we have one stand that we're calling uh, stand 1A and 1B, and it's separated by the driveway to the house um, that's along the river. And then we had a second small stand that was at the um, up on the other side of the driveway, um, a young stand of mostly white pine and some mixed hardwood. Um, while out there, observed that much of the property had been harvested, uh, looked like they were cutting in roads, probably planning on future uh, residential development with their cutting styles. Um, it looked like a lot of strips, and then they left buffers in between the strips with mature wood in those strips. Um, a lot of black birch poles coming in, which is exciting. Um, a lot better than having invasives or um, uh, some of the other less desirable species to come in. Um, I did have a chance to run the cruise, but I also noticed in the landowner goals and objectives that um, no commercial timber harvesting was allowed on the property. So 
I'll include all that stuff, assign volumes and values to it as well, but won't put a lot of emphasis on um, silviculture. Um, talk more about recreation and then wildlife habitat as well. Uh, which also kind of leads me to a couple of things. One is um, at one of the cruise points, we had a barred owl that hung out almost above our heads uh, for the entire point, let, it, let us get fairly close to it and actually never flew away. We were able to just kind of hang out and watch it for a little while, which is pretty exciting. You know, I don't get to see barred owls in the woods that often. I hear them all the time, but they don't usually let us get close enough. Um, a lot of the hemlock that is in there is uh, unfortunately infected with hemlock woolly adelgid, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, I didn't see much mortality from the adelgid yet, but it's certainly a concern and we might want to kind of try to figure out what we do about it over the long term. Obviously hemlock provides good thermal cover for wildlife and habitat and things like that. Um, so it's a very important species to keep, but um, I've not worked with it much up where I live. Uh, it, luckily, it's uh, not made it up our way, but it sounds like there's been some research done um, at the state's level on some practices to kind of manage the hemlock to get it a little bit more vigorous to help it um, resist the adelgid. And then the, the last thing I kind of had as a bullet point was, uh, did observe some invasive plants on the property. Um, the biggest was uh, multiflora rose um, in uh, kind of along the driveway going into the parking lot. And then again, on the opposite side of the driveway from where that uh, house along the, uh, the river is. Uh, it was actually pretty heavy in there in places. So um, not sure what your ideas are on addressing the multiflora rose, but it's certainly um, established and um, it might be good to get rid of it, although it doesn't seem like it's spreading very much uh, for now. I think we're keeping the overstory dark enough so that it's not getting a, a good foothold and not um, advancing. So that's kind of my bullet points, what I've observed out in the field and I really wanted to kind of hear what the commission um, had for thoughts on the property and things like that. Well, I have a couple, I have a couple of questions. So one thing that we have seen a little bit, um, you know, you're familiar with there's sort of um, railing system that's built out there with footbridges um, that was, you know, built to sort of overlook the water yep. and We've had a few times where trees have come down sure. onto that. And I'm wondering if there are some trees that are dying, would it make more sense for us to take those down so that they don't fall on that and damage it? Because that would, that would be significant cost to try and replace that, I think. Um, and then the other question I have is, there's a large area where um, emerald ash borer has taken out a lot of ash trees. What's the best practice there? Do you just leave them there to die and they'll fall over and just, that's it? Or do you do, you do anything when you have you know, I, I think you might know where I'm talking about where there's like, I don't know, a few dozen ash trees that are all just dying or dead already. Was that adjacent to the driveway uh, going to the parking lot? That's one place where I observed some ash. Yeah, I think it's actually, you kind of take the trail out as far as you can take it. Um, and it, I guess it would take you to sort of the Eastern edge of the property and the water would be on your right and the trees are on your left. Okay. And that's where I saw, I think it was last year, the year before that, boy, a lot of those trees are dead. Okay. A lot. Um, and I just didn't know if they're with us having emerald ash borer now for a few years, is there any practices that are, you know, in place for forestry for those trees once they die? 
So what we've been doing on a, on a commercial standpoint is if we've got mature or over mature large diameter stems will, and they're still alive and they're still viable, we'll salvage them typically. Um, on a property like this where aesthetics and recreation are the primary goals, um, it might be wise to just maybe leave them for wildlife habitat, but possibly um, you know, remove the trees that are within striking distance of the recreational trails. Okay. Because the, the, uh, the cost of moving equipment in to remove those trees would probably be greater than what the value of the trees are plus the aesthetics and everything like that of, of dragging the trees through the woods tends to make a big mess. Right, I, I would, yeah, I was thinking more of drop, uh, sort of chop and drop kind of thinking, yep. yeah. Yep, and again, the ones that are within striking distance of erect trails, I would highly recommend that. Yeah. The one nice thing about ash is typically as it dies and falls apart, um, it falls apart in small sections from the top down. Yeah. They don't usually fall all at once, or if they do, um, it's, it's fairly rare that they do that. Okay. Any other questions? I mean, the only other thing I know is that we want to, we really want to map the trails. Um, we want to, you know, maybe make sure they're well marked and keep people on the trails that are designated and not sort of have a bunch of rabbit paths running all over the property. Um, so we wanna kind of have people enjoy the property and go on the trails and have the nice walks, but also just stay, stay where they're supposed to stay more so that the rest of the area doesn't get eroded. Mm -hmm. And um, Ellen, I, I wasn't privy to the um, meeting that you and Greg had, but um, he did tell me that uh, he was going to get started on the, the recreation portion of the forest stewardship plan very shortly. So I, I believe he's already started the mapping work and um, is kind of coming up with some ideas. Yeah, I really enjoyed because he's a he's kind of a recreation trails guy, like geographer. So he's a mapper, but he also really understands trails. So I think he had a pretty good idea when when I finished up of what we're looking for and um, so um, yeah, I'm interested to see what his final recommendations will be, but I think it'll be nice. One of the things we talked about, if you all remember that when you, um, you know, when, let's say you were walking in, so sort of driving in and you take that first left where all those multiple rows are at that corner, then the trail is like a woods road yep. Yep. and it goes along and then it goes down to that bridge that I think the neighbor built from the, the neighboring community and it goes to that private driveway. Yeah. And then uh, there's no trails on the other side of that private driveway. And I don't think we haven't recommended any trails because it's, it's, it doesn't go anywhere. And it's, it's a small area over there. Yeah. But one thing I talked to Greg about, and I, it's for us to talk about is, I know the community is not supposed to drive around that community. We're just supposed to drive in and then turn into Heron Point Sanctuary. But because that trail is there and there's that footbridge and it goes to that driveway, if you walk that and turn left, go down the driveway, back out to the subdivision, can people walk through there? Because the dilemma is we have this trail and if we put it on our map, then people are gonna walk down there, but then it doesn't go anywhere. And you're not, and I'm not sure if you're not supposed to walk, like are we not supposed to encourage people even to walk through the community? Yeah, I would say that that has been the polite message that we have received from the um, Heron Estates community is that they, they would like to confine, you know, people drive to the parking area, park there and access the property from there and not walk too much around other parts of their, their uh, property, their community. Um, it just creates a little dilemma for then do we show that the trail is there so people are going to walk some people are going to walk down it and do we not show it on the map or do we say this leads to a private community or like i don't know i mean my recommendation would be to to not um just because it doesn't like you said it doesn't lead anywhere and it 
yes, it's an informal trail, but we're not, we're not sort of listing it as a place to go because it doesn't go anywhere would be my answer. I don't know what other people think, but. That's, that sort of makes sense. And we could have a trail marker to where you do turn and then maybe a little sign. Greg and I had talked about, you know, having uh, engraved signs, like something more natural kinds of signs out there. And it could say, this leads to a private community, please respect their privacy or something like that. Yeah, I think that would be fine. That makes sense. Back to the invasives, we did have one little workday, COVID sort of separation workday of some of the members conservation commission. So I think our I think our intent is to do more of the mechanical removal of invasives, maybe have some work days when we can get more people together. So that's great. Yeah. yeah. There's definitely a lot of um, people that use that area that feel very strongly and are are happy to um, help. I just think we haven't been in a place where people felt comfortable and, you know, we just had restrictions, so we couldn't do it. But when, when we do get back to that place, I think if we had um, a request that we wanted to put out for volunteers, I think we'd get a good response because we did in the past. We had some good cleanup days out there. That's great. Um, and then the stuff that's on the other side of that driveway, um, it's pretty wet up in there. And I think if you don't do any forestry management or don't disturb the overstory, uh, I think you have a pretty good chance of it staying stable and not spreading too far. Um, there were some fairly substantial bushes in there, but again, as the overstory fills in, I think it will shade that out and it won't be as detrimental. Um, certainly if it, if it was removed, it would help it. It would eradicate it a little bit more, but I don't think you'll ever get it out of there completely without really diligent hard work. So do you think any, um, any forestry that you might recommend would be um, just small scale trying to improve forest health or what, what are your thoughts actually on any forestry there or just let nature do its thing or? Well, one of the, one of the things in the uh, Land Rover Goals and Objectives was um, songbirds were a desired species. And um, it, so some, some small openings might be good to try and get break up the overstory because you've got kind of two, um, you don't have much vertical diversity in there. It's, it's kind of one, two age classes. You've got the uh, black birch poles um, adjacent to mature and over mature white pine. Uh, so a possible idea would be to kind of go in and take out some of the strips of the mature white pine um, just to kind of get another age class going, if, if that makes sense to everybody, um, or get some young growth in there um, where you're not really trying to attract deer. And I actually didn't see very much deer sign in there at all. Um, it, it, it might bring some deer in, but more than likely it, it's going to attract the, the um the songbirds and um, small mammals and things like that. Uh, again, in there, I, I, I'm a little nervous about doing commercial forestry just because of the, the recreational pressure and the, um, and things like that. But what might be a kind of a fun project is if um, the town needed some um, wood for a project, um, say those um, boardwalks, although you probably want to build those at a PT, uh, but that pine would make really beautiful beams or lumber if there were a project nearby and a, a portable sawmill could be found, uh, you know, a small operation to kind of keep it local and as an educational experience too uh, for the, the community. Hmm. So a lot, lots of opportunities, but I would shy, I would, I would highly recommend against commercial timber harvesting in there. Yeah, as you said, the deed sort of does kind of limit, uh, it doesn't really specify what commercial they're talking about, but it does say no industrial commercial activity. Sure. On the sanctuary in the deed, so there's, it's always a, you know, area. It, yeah, <laughs> for forest yeah. health, is that commercial? Or right, and and again, you know, trying to manage that hemlock really adelgid and keep the hemlock healthy, we might be able to kind of um, work some wildlife habitat into that and, um, 
also some, um, you know, forest health um, tactics there as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I will admit, I, I usually do a lot better when I'm out in the field. So I'm looking forward to being, being able to go for a walk with folks and kind of talk about ideas and look at different areas and maybe brainstorm some, some ideas that, that the CONSCOM has um, while we're out there. Maybe we should just, if, if you know, because we didn't really go through the form, but what I had put in there, um, because there, there is a deed that describes the property, and then there was a brochure that was put together when the town acquired the property, and it seemed to me the, the key uh, reasons uh, for the property were certainly scenic beauty, um, sort of a, an, a, as John said, aesthetic sort of contemplation, meditation, you know, it's just a really nice walk for people. Um, wildlife habitat, uh, maybe fishing. I think Patrick, you had mentioned that some people might want to go over there and fish. And then the other possibility was if people want to go in and launch a kayak. And I didn't know if that was, is that something we specifically want to include? There are certainly things by deed that are not allowed, camping, hunting, trapping. Yeah. Um, the commercial activities that we talked about. And it's really uh, foot traffic only, not no biking. No horses, no ATVs and that kind of thing, of course. Yeah, I mean, I know people have gone over there to fish uh, during striped bass season when the herring are running up the river. There'll be some people that fish over there. Um, not a lot, but there'll be some. And then I saw a lot of people paddle boarding last year. So I don't know if, if, if all the parking was taken up downtown and they couldn't launch they might come over there and launch a paddle board because you can carry one of those, you know, easily down to the water. Um, let me just see if there's anything else on here um, that we might want to talk about. Um, I mean, I, yeah. It's a great place to um, sometimes see the bald eagle that oh, comes up mm -hmm. that that comes up the river. Um, but I don't know if there's anything else on here really that's um, that we need to go over. But I do. I think it would be great. I agree. It would be great if we could set up a date. Um, I think later in the afternoons are good, even if it's on a work day, that gives people more opportunity to go. Okay. And I think, um, I'm not sure what the numbers are right now. Uh, does anyone know what the restriction are, restrictions are for outdoor numbers for gatherings? Is it 10 people? Six, six people, Sue is saying. Um, so it probably would be surprising if we could get six people to show up, <laughs> but, um, but if you want to, um, give us some dates, um, where you would be available to do that, um, David's raising his hand. Oh no, he's turning a light. Um, then we could schedule, schedule a time where we could, people could go out there and walk the property with you. Okay. And would it be beneficial to coordinate with Greg to have him come along as well? Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. And then I think once, once we do get that scheduled, John, just so you know, we, well, that's, a, that's where it gets kind of questionable. I don't know if, if we have more than three of us there do we have to open up to the public then? <laughs> and then we, we'd be over the six number again. So I don't know how that works. I don't know if Megan has any ideas about that when you do these outside meetings. I don't know the exact numbers. I do know when we had the Riverfront Advisory meeting outdoors um, a few weeks ago, there was a lot of people, um, okay. including the town manager. So I, <laughs> so, um, I can look into you know, figure out what, what, if the restrictions have changed or something and get more right. details. Okay. That'd be helpful. Just cause yeah. I want to, I want to stay within 
uh, the open meeting laws, which is as if we have, you know, a quorum of people there, we're supposed to open it up to the public. We could still have the meeting. We just have to make sure the public's informed and they know they can come if they want. Okay. All right. Any other questions, thoughts? Okay, uh, that's well, all. That's all I had, and I wanted to throw this out there. Um, if anybody thinks of anything down the road, feel free to you know get in touch with me via either email or or uh, uh, a phone call. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank Thanks, you. John. Okay. We are down to approval of minutes. Did everyone get a chance to? Review the minutes from March 11th meeting. I just had one, um, it's more like a question on the, I think it's page three or number three about the Neil Mill Road project and the process. There's a paragraph that talks of, or I guess number, th well, there's a, there's a numbering of the process I don't have in front of me. And it doesn't mention us in the process again. So did we discuss that after the site visit, it would come back, we would come back in the next meeting after the site visit and be able to provide comment or are we not doing that? So so here's my understanding of that, that process. Um, first of all, right now, there's, there isn't anything scheduled as far as a site visit. Um, that doesn't mean that there won't be, but there isn't one right now. Um, the only item that I believe we would comment on would be the road itself. Um, and uh, so what still has to happen is the, um, I think, my understanding is there's a bit of, a, and Megan, Megan might have some insight into this, but it sounds like there's a bit of a um, decision-making that needs to happen in terms of who goes next in this decision-making process. Is it the planning board or is it the town council? And um, right now the planning board, I don't feel like it sounds like they don't have anything in front of them that they are going to do next. Um, and I don't know if that means that now the town council is going to pick the issue up and have a review of what should happen on, on, on the class six road and, you know, approve that. And then the whole project would then go back to the planning board to review. So, so that part is where I'm, kind of in the dark about what's going to happen next. Um, okay, so just sorry to interrupt because my question was about the minutes and I think we're into a discussion which that's your prerogative, but uh, I just wanted to clarify if we need to insert something in minutes, but it sounds like since the process is confused, the minutes can stand as they are, I think. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to take no. this down there. I was just trying to no, answer the question. Okay. No, I listened to it three times before I checked all that in, it sounded like they came to us, they were going to the planning board, The then they were going to do a site walk, go back to the planning board and on to the town council for final decision-making. That's what it sounded like. And it didn't ever sound like it was coming back to us that he sort of said, we should go to the planning board hearing, to the hearings, the public hearings, that we should make a presence as you, conservation. It sounded like that's what you want to happen. It was very confusing. I think it would behoove us, in fact, just to table discussion about Neil Mill Road altogether, since I think it's a, a such a ball in play and anything we're it's like talking about COVID, like, should we have a picnic next Sunday? Well, there's the weather and there's COVID. So um, we probably should just table discussing. Uh, before we do, I had a quick question, actually. Um, and this is just more out of probably ignorance and my own 
questioning, but uh, earlier Jim Gove mentioned something about uh, not being able to sell landlocked property. Um, and I just wonder how this doesn't follow along those lines as well. Did well, catch that? that, yeah, I, I, I think at this point, I think we should table that question, return to review of the minutes, approval of the minutes, and then if at the end of the meeting you have a you want to return to that question, I would be happy to take it up at that time. But I think we should stay at this point with just review of the minutes. If there's no further uh, amendments or changes or questions on the minutes, I would look for a motion to approve those minutes. I move to, move to appro approve the minutes. <laughs> Chris Black. Okay, thank you, Chris. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay. Second. All right, thanks, Melissa. All in favor of approval of the minutes? Aye. 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 <laughs> Okay. All right. Next, we have, we are at the point where we would uh, normally elect our officers for the coming year. So um, currently we have all of our seats filled and we have one alternate. Melissa, we have an open vacant seat for an alternate. So if anyone knows anyone who would be interested in serving as an alternate on the Conservation Commission, we would welcome you. You may pick up an application at Town Hall um, and fill it out and um, turn it in. So um, without any further ado, I will ask if there are any uh, nominations for chair of the Conservation Commission. Last year at this time, Patrick, you expressed interest in retaining the seat as chair. Right now I'm noticing uh, abject silence from you, but I'm curious, I would, I, would in, I would enjoy nominating you to carry on as chair if you're interested in doing it. Uh, I am interested in doing it, but I will put the caveat in there that I would like this to be the last year I am the chair. Um, I would like to pass the chair on after this year. So I, I am happy to serve and, and privileged to serve one more year, but I do feel like at that point, it would be a good place for us to take a, a have a new chair. So I just want to state that going into this. Did you catch that, Madam Honorable Sue Frick? <laughs> <laughs> It was, okay. it was pretty weaselly, but yes, I got it. <laughs> Are we doing one at a time or a slate? So I'll second that if we're doing one at a time. Okay, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, now do we have a motion for vice chair? I will make a motion for <laughs> Melissa to continue to serve as vice chair. No, no objection by I'm, Melissa. I'm, let me see if I can remember how that verbiage went. I am happy to remain in the position for the coming year. Okay. <laughs> All right. Do I have a second on my motion for Melissa? I'll, I'll second that. Aww. Thank you, Sam. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Zero, zero. Okay. And then we also need a treasurer. I don't mind doing it unless somebody else wants it. <laughs> then I make a motion that Ellen serve as our treasurer. Second. All in favor? Aye. Melissa? Thank you, Ellen. Who seconded? Melissa. I did. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. You're welcome. Okay. Um, 
the one other thing that I do want to mention is thank you to Megan. I know you are serving on several committees within the city, our town council. So I appreciate you continuing to serve on this committee. We do value your um, participation and presence here and input. So thank you for doing that. I know you're taking on a lot. So, so thanks for doing that. Um, and we should be getting a planning board representative next week. Um, so I'm excited about that. So that'll be good to have someone back from the planning board uh, serving. But I believe they have to meet next week to make their committee assignments. All right, that we can now go on to Ellen. Uh, Treasurer's report, okay. Uh, no new current use last month. The general fund balance is $827.70. Seems like we're on track for that one. The conservation fund balance total is $275.90, which includes the um, amount in the Shanda fund as well. We expenditures were the $4,800 for John Brown for the work they did at Wigan Farm. And um, income was $44.14. I did submit a reimbursement to New Hampshire Fishing Game for $3,150, so $3,150 for they paid, that's the portion they were paying for the Wigan Farm John Brown work. So that's nice. So we ended up paying um, like $1,700, I guess, and they paid $3,150. So that's nice. Mm. And, and how much oh sorry that's right no the the john brown cost was forty hundred dollars forty eight hundred dollars which is has already been taken out of our fund and we're getting 3150 back from fishing game and again just a reminder that we still have outstanding the twenty five hundred dollars for the heron point <laughs> management plan that john's working on and seventy five thousand dollars for the clark easement which currently is not gone through yet? Uh, it has just gone through, actually. Uh, we just got an email today. Um, so that check should be issued next week. Um, uh, every I got an email from CELT and I contacted uh, Bill Tappen with the um, finance department here with Town of Newmarket um, that he'll be issuing a check next week. Um, for the 75,000 and Epping has put in their money as well. So that deal should be completely wrapped up at this point, pretty much as far as all the signatories and contributors. Okay. And I didn't know if you wanted to do other expenditures now. I know there was something about the fishing derby and I think Chris, was there something about the Arbor Day contribution or? Yeah, I think we should go over those. That would be that would be great, Ellen, to combine that with these these requests now. So, um, we do have a request um, from the New Market Fishing Derby. They are have gotten a permit from the state to run their fishing derby, which is traditionally held Father's Day weekend. Um, so it's like June seven seventeenth. I want to say. Let me look. I have it. I have it in here. Um, it's, it's right around that time. Um, well, it's a request for $1,500, which is what we've provided them every single year um, that we've supported this. And it goes 100% to paying for the fish that they stock in the pond. So um, this is a trout fishing derby. So they stock, they buy, purchase trout from a trout farm and put them, stock them in the pond. The Boy Scouts stock them in there. Um, and then the kids have the fishing derby uh, a couple of days later. Um, so that is the request. So I would um, make a motion that we um, once again, support the fishing derby um, by contributing $1,500 towards that. Do I have a second? I'm thrilled to second at Blackstone. Okay, all in favor? 
Okay. I will let the Fishing Derby Committee know that. It's June 19th. June 19th. Thank you, Sue. And the other request we'll have is for $150, and that will go towards our um, cooperative event with the New Market Public Library, which will be bringing in Kevin Martin to um, give a talk on trees. Um, and that will occur at 7.30 on June 2nd. And it will be a Zoom meeting that you can sign up for. It will be promoted by New Market Public Library. Um, and as soon as we get the promotion materials from them, we will, I'll make sure everybody here has it so we can put it on our social media. Um, um, but the library does a great job of promoting their events. So I guess I should make a motion to approve $150 for paying for a um, guest speaker fee for Kevin Martin to perform his dis talk on trees. Sure, Blackstone second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Zero, zero. Okay. Anything else under financial that we had? Did you uh, pursue anything more with scholarship, school scholarship? I haven't heard anything back, but I will keep um, I will keep pushing on that, Alan. Thank you for reminding me. And did we already approve that amount of a thousand, or how does that? No, it, we haven't. Done it it ha we haven't, but we again, if if we get applications, I I think we would approve it. Yeah, I mean, okay, so that's just pen that's not approved yet. Okay. Yeah. That's all I had for finance. Okay. Ellen, by the way, the um, Wigan Farm looks fantastic. That back, oh, great, yeah. I can't, I didn't realize that it had been cleared so much. Um, yeah, yeah, and the good part was they, um, you know, they did about an acre up by the gate, and which you know I worked with them. I was out there like I spent like six hours with them. <laughs> um, I spent a couple. I, I can't, I'm kind of particular about what that kind of work gets done. So. I thought they were going to pay for the acre up by the house because they have a setback requirement from hunt. It's because it's kind of hunting related habitat work, but they said they would fund it because it's it's part of the bigger, you know, it doesn't matter if the animal goes through there or if it goes over here, right? So, yeah. so it's nice. So they pay yeah. for the amount we had asked for originally. But um, yeah, John Brown does a really good job. They have really big equipment and they can get really close to the stone walls and they can go really flat to the ground so they get the invasives. I mean, they'll, some of them will pop up, but um, I haven't been back, so I need to go back and look. Yeah, I'm just some, pretty happy with their work. They did a nice yeah, job. Behind the stone wall is pretty much, I would say, 85% yeah. cleared. It's I, crazy. Yeah. We left the um, Red Sea. It was also a wonderful job, Ellen. Oh. No, go ahead. The communication with us and the town and, and putting bulletins out about the sawhorses and what was happening when and whatnot was outstanding. Yeah, thanks for that with the social media. That was good. Yeah, it, it looks great. And um, I think if we, uh, we do have to go back up there maybe and pick up a few logs and move them. Um, so, cause we want them to mow right up next to that stone wall. If they can keep that mowed when they mow it once a year, that will help control those invasives. So I'm really excited cause that was, we worked so hard to push those invasives back and then they just came back the next year is so frustrating. Yeah. Uh, so now on the so, inside of the wall, I think the idea that there's two and a half acres on the other side, which we want that to grow up into shrubs. So we are gonna have to do some volunteer mechanical work in there. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk, we have a lot on the agenda. So I think I sent out the, if you've seen the interpretive signs out there, they're all really pretty much. Yeah. So um, we put that on for the next month's agenda. So if you have any ideas, um, I think it'll be nice to get some new, new signs out there. Okay. I think we should hear next from the Riverfront com uh, Committee. Um, here, I'll provide a, a brief recap, I guess, Megan, jump in if I miss anything. Um, we were out there 
March 23rd, uh, we met with the town manager, the committee members. Um, Mike Hoffman was there. Uh, DES was in attendance as well as a couple um, gentlemen from UNH. Um, productive discussion, looked at the Shanda Park area, walked them down the riverfront a little bit, um, showed them potential you know, bridge, pedestrian bridge landing locations, things like that. So uh, sort of a narrow focus on Shanda Park, but did also kind of show them all of the components of it as well, of potential ideas, you know, in discussion. Um, so the next meeting is uh, Tuesday, the 13th. So we have not had another formal meeting since then. Um, but basically, we left the uh, prior discussion with the intent that we were going to potentially start um, pursuing a grant opportunities um, to see if we can get any outside funding, um, likely starting with DES uh, to basically engage somebody to start making conceptual you know, designs of the area. So uh, that's sort of where we're at. Um, you know, I'll bring it up at the discussion, but luckily, you know, again, with my day job, we have dozens of people who that's their exact job. So I at least did do a little kind of digging on my end to see what that is and all of that. And um, the bottom line is I think the DES grant will actually be a pretty good starting point to get us on our way um, and, and maybe generate some of those images. So that, that could be a good first, uh, first step. <laughs> Thank you guys. All right, we'll keep keep uh, keep going. It's progress. That's great to hear. Um, all right, uh, Megan, do you have anything else to uh, share from the town council? No major updates at the moment. Um, the only thing I was going to share is that I will still be um, here with conservation commission, which I'm happy about I do enjoy being here I don't want to, I don't know if you all know but I also work for extension in my real world so it it's makes a lot of sense for me to be here um but I am stretched a little bit thin so I appreciate that acknowledgement Patrick um but I'm I'm here and I'm, I'm happy about it well thank you we're happy about it too all right um let's see and we don't have a planning board rep but like I said I expect us to have one shortly and i'm excited about that because they've got some new members on there and so i think we've got got a good opportunity to get someone who'll bring a lot um so that is all i have on the agenda now we can come back if there's i know melissa had a question there was if there's any other open questions like i said as far as um 75 neil mill road there there is nothing pending in front of us to um, address. Like there's no, there's no formal role for the Conservation Commission, although I would say our input and our, um, our comments are going to be welcomed by both the Planning Board and the Town Council um, because we are one of the major property owners abutting the this proposal. So um, I, I feel like there's opportunity for us to provide commentary, but there's not an official vote or um, we don't have a an official capacity in this. I just want to be clear about that. We don't have anything that we can um, that we're there we're voting uh, yes or no on this project. We don't have that any any sort of jurisdiction um, that I'm aware of. Um, as far as Melissa, your question, my understanding is that um, you know the Class Six Road is a right of way to that property. So um, you know every parcel in the town, I believe, that is considered a buildable lot has to have a right of way that provides access to it or it's not a buildable lot, right? So that's why they can use the class six road to make a drive or use it to access this property is that that is their right of way. Um, that's why they can potentially build a house there and potentially use the class six road. 
Right. I actually don't even know that there's a question of whether someone could build a house there, Chris. I mean, I, I, I don't know that there's, um, it's just a question of what you can alter, how much you can alter that road, I believe, is the question before the town council, um, because they have jurisdiction over what right. happens on new market roads. But, you know, if someone wanted to assemble their own cabin out there and not do anything to that road, they would, I think they could easily get a building permit to do that. I don't think there's any reason why someone couldn't do that. Um, the only reason they have to go before the town council is because they're proposing an alteration to that road. Can you clarify something you said earlier about that maybe this is before the council first? Is that actually in the works or what, what did you mean? That seems to be a question between the planning board and the town council is my understanding. When I simply asked if there was a site walk planned and they said they're the planning board that, that they're at a standstill, that they're, they don't have anything, they kind of don't have a, a plan right now as to what they're going to do next. And they were unsure. So yeah, it has not come to council yet. So the applicant is not presenting new information that they're meeting next week at the planning board meeting, which was they were waiting for that to then schedule a site walk? Um, I guess we'll find out because I don't have any privy that they're going to do that. I don't have any information that they are, Ellen. That doesn't mean that they're not. I just asked when I, I simply wanted to know, is a site walk scheduled? Because if there was, I want to just make sure and share it with everybody here. Um, and when I asked if there was a site walk scheduled, I was told, no, there is no site walk scheduled. And there is no pending matter that they had to discuss. Because I asked if there was anything else pending that I, you know, could come and comment on. And there was no. The answer right. was no. I think we're waiting to see if they're going to submit more information. But I guess I would, um, you know, the planning board has very specific jurisdiction and the council has very specific jurisdiction, but uh, our board actually has in some ways a broader uh, role to play in that we look at all natural resources in town. We look at, uh, and that's a very broad definition. So, so we look at recreation, we look at wetlands, we look at wildlife habitat. So I don't, I think we're actually somewhat unburdened by very specific jurisdiction. So we can comment as we would anything about the importance of protecting wetlands, of protecting recreational pathways. So I guess I'm curious, are we going to do that as a commission or if not, should we do that as individuals? I just want to clarify what our process is. My feeling would be yes, that, that I would think it would be appropriate for us to comment um, and but my question is, um, I, I kind of feel like I would like some direction from who is going to make this decision. Um, is it gonna, you know, is the planning board going to make some sort of decision? And then we could comment on that before it goes to the town council or is the town council then gonna place this on their agenda? And if they were, then I would, suggest that we before that meeting present the the town council with an opinion um, on why we think this is a good or not good um, project to proceed with but th again that's where i feel like i don't have an answer as to where where it stands yeah um, I, I think we're all on the same page on that yeah i think they haven't provided any new information at this point so okay thank you for that clue any other? Uh, I have questions? an agenda related question. Um, yep. When I see on one of these agendas, Shanda Park permits, NCC, Park oh, and Rec, and Go you. Local Race. Thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you. That's time is of the essence, yeah, thank you. Yes, um, let's get to that. Um, okay, so we have three requests um, and I'm gonna do them in order that I receive them. So to be fair to those applicants, the first is um, a usage of the park um, from the Newmarket Community Church. Um, they would like to use the park um, on June 10th, uh, 2021. Um, 
purpose is to host a lunch truck for our community. The event will be free food event for community members. Um, they're targeting specifically clients at their food pantry. Mm. Um, they will, uh, I'm just looking to see if they put a time down. Uh, I'm assuming this is over the lunch hour, but I don't see a specific time, but I believe, I'm just looking if they said, um, I mean, I could, I could go back to them, but they didn't put a specific time down. Um, but I'm assuming it's over the lunch hour. Um, if everybody, if people are okay with that, we can, we could vote on that, even though we don't have a time period. That sounds creative and fun. <laughs> Okay. You want to give them a little bit of a window if we vote on like just the lunch hour, what if they need to be there two hours before and two hours after? Right. Just Should we say from 10 to 2 just to give them time to set up and time to clean up? Sure. Okay. So first I'll make a motion that we amend their application to say that we are granting them permission to use the park from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on June 10th. A second. Do I have a sec Second on that motion. Thank That's you, Melissa. Up. Okay, all in favor of approving that amendment? Is there a quick discussion though first? Oh, sorry, discussion. I'd like to see it say 2.30, just to really give them time to have lunch be maybe 12 to 1.30 and then clean up and get out of there since we don't know the time. Well, we could even put it to three if you want. That's a little excessive because we have to be responsible to other people that take little kids down there and like look at ducks and stuff. But I, I'm not adverse to three. I just think two might crimp them since we don't know what lunchtime means. And lunch okay. easily <laughs> could be like 10 until two. All right. So amend to 2.30. So <laughs> or three, 2.30, go with 2.30, like an auction. Do I hear three o'clock? <laughs> 2.30, okay, so, so again- Thank you. The amended application would be on June 10th from 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Second. I have a second on that motion. Second. Thank, Thank you, you. All in favor? Aye. Okay, opposed, no opposed, okay. All right, next application um, we have is from the New Market Recreation Department. They are submitting an application for their summer concert series, Arts in the Park. Um, this will take place on Tuesdays, starting on July 6th and running through August 26th. So every Tuesday during this time period and will run from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, they, they always have the new market police there, um, too, just so everybody knows, um, to provide, you know, for security or, you know, there for policing purposes. Um, they've been doing this for years. I don't know if anyone has any questions or discussion on this item. Okay, do I have a motion to approve that application? I motion that we uh, approve the rec department's request to have arts in the park this year at Shanda Park. Second. A second. I'll Thanks, go for Sam. it, Sam. Sam? <laughs> gotcha. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No opposed. Okay. And our last application is for this coming weekend. So it's just around the corner. This is Loco Sports will be running their road race. And the finish of the road race is at Shanda Park. So what that means is that they will have the park pretty much from dusk till dawn. So our no, I didn't say that right. From dawn <laughs> till dusk. 
So they start setting up literally like right away in the morning and they're pretty much there all day long. So um, is, is, it's an all, all day event. Um, they have restrooms down there and it's, you know, they, they take up the entire park. So I, I just wanna make sure that I'm very clear about what their request is. For those of you that aren't familiar with this road race, it, it's, it uses the entire park for the entire day every year. Patrick, I'm curious, the, what was the date on their application? Um, I just got this this week. So I, they were definitely behind. They don't, uh, they have 33021. Mm. Um, but I, I think I got it from Wendy. It, it might have been Friday, but it was, it was pretty, you know, it was pretty short notice. And I don't know, it could have been a permitting question that they were having. I don't know what right. their permitting process is with the state, but usually we did do get more advanced notice from them that this is happening. That's what I thought, because those little light bulb dot signs are, were in town long before we heard about this happening. So, all right, speak now or forever hold your peace, Blackstone. Got it. <laughs> all right, well, that's, that's a fair question, Chris. That's a fair question. Yeah. Um, any other questions? All right. Is there a motion to approve Loco Sports request to Shanda Park for the road race ending spot on the date of April 11th? I'll make that motion. Thank you. <laughs> Second. Thank Go you. Go for it, Bill. David. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All right. And like Chris pointed out, the signs are in town. They are running the race. So, <laughs> um, all right. I don't have anything else. So I, I am, we are at 8.53. Patrick, can I give a quick update on the cleanup? Oh, I'm sorry, Melissa. Yes. That's okay. That's I okay. Um, so the response has been really, really good. Um, I'm, oh. I've been um really happy with people there's been a couple people i think that have been disappointed that we're not providing supplies or like a centralized pickup or dumpster but um for the most part they understand you know that this is a weird year um we've probably about 28 households that have signed up for more than 30 oh. streets and i'm waiting to hear back from a local junior high coach who has four uh teams that are going to sign up for um like a street or neighborhood with each team um which is great so that'll add cool. to the well, that's really cool. That's I very know, cool. I'm pretty excited. I wasn't sure how it was going to go with, you know, just sort of having virtual signups and kind of clean up whenever, um, but it's going really well. So I think it'll be great. I did. Um, I've been wanting to try my hand at ArcGIS story maps. I've never done it before. So I did that earlier today and I made a story map with uh, the town and the streets marked that I've been signed up for. And I posted that link to social media um, well, to the, the Facebook group. Um, and people can kind of hover over the streets that are marked and just see the first name of the person that has signed up for, um, for that street. And I'm hoping to add to that after the cleanup is done with information on, um, you know, hopefully information on how much trash people have picked up and maybe some pictures to link to it. So I think that would be kind of cool for people to see after the fact. Um, also, I talked with um, Bill from Iron Goat junk removal um, a couple days ago. They're a local company based in Newmarket. Um, he is also a Dover firefighter. Um, so it's firefighter owned and veteran owned and local. And they've um, offered to pick up any large items that people cannot feasibly get from wherever oh, they nice. find it to the transfer station. So I was really excited about that. Um, and we've kind of set up a little bit of a system. Um, I haven't emailed the registrants yet, but I will. Basically, if someone finds a large item like a mattress or a large tire, um, they will snap a picture of it, um, get as much detailed um, information about the location as possible. So whether that's like, if it's really close to an intersection or maybe they have um, their phone with them and they can take a snapshot on Google Maps and get the, um, GPS coordinates, and I will sort of compile that list as the week 
goes on and I will get him all the information on Friday. And then on Saturday, the 24th, he's going to go out and pick up anything that was reported um, from town members um, and anything that comes in on Saturday, I'm going to get him as well. Um, but that that's really great. I'm really happy about that. And also I had one person who's registered who offered to um, donate money next year to provide supplies for the cleanup. So that is pretty cool too. So uh, overall, I think it's going well. <laughs> I think that's that's great, Melissa. Great job. Thank you very much. And that's um, awesome. Really that's, great. That's uh, a great start. The only question I have is: Should we refer people to the 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 one that uh, the town is doing for that if they want really want supplies provided for them? So I did do that via email with the few people that oh, um, that specifically asked about that. Um, and also, I think it would be good, and I can do this maybe this week, just to, you know, give like a plug to that cleanup too on our social media page and just sort of say, if you're looking for a more organized event or maybe maybe your weekdays are really busy, but, you know, Sundays are your day to, to get out and do stuff, here's a, another great local cleanup event and just post that flyer. Well, I think the great thing would be also you'd be able to provide them with a map and say, right. here's all the streets that have already been done. Fo fo people can focus on the ones that haven't been done and we could we could potentially clean up all of Newmarket. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <That'd be great. laughs> a, a phenomenal thought. Um, so great work. I'm, I'm excited. And uh, I know that uh, that this wouldn't have been the success it's been without your involvement. So thank you oh, so much for taking you. the lead on this. I really oh, appreciate yeah. that. Awesome. Um, uh, one thing I want to make sure and, and announce is next month we will have as a guest speaker, Mr. Fox composting coming. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure, cause I know there's a lot of interest in this um, uh, special guest. And I want to make sure and start promoting it right now. So uh, next month, Mr. Fox composting is coming to provide all the great information about composting. Um, is there any other guests that we should promote at this time, Chris, too? Do you want to announce? No, that's as far ahead. I don't have a name yet for June with um, landscape and outdoor lighting. So that that is something we mentioned and talked about. So I'm that's what I'm working on for June so that people can be aware of what to do to help nighttime pollinators, migrating birds um, and some habitat issues with nighttime or landscape lighting. Okay. Patrick? Yes, Sue. So. New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commission lunch and learn. Oh, Chris, yeah, you wanted to promote this. So do you want to put a plug in for that? Sure. It's as simple as, um, as conservation commissioners, we are all members of the New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commissions. The, um, yesterday was the first in their series that could particularly pertain to our work. Um, it was Emma Erler talking about invasives again, but I did get that video today and I can forward that. And we're, I didn't, I already forwarded it. I forwarded it to Patrick, I believe. I'm not sure who else. I think I forwarded it to everybody here. So, yeah. um, and it's not a smuggled video. We're allowed to share it, which is something I always like to clarify because I don't want to get videos of, that are, are of workshops that should not be forwarded. So anyway, um, Check out Emma Erler, Invasives, and a lot is going on with many, many towns hoping to work with even town park and rec departments that might be doing town-wide plannings or garden clubs doing plannings or whatnot to, to avoid some of these species that look innocuous, but in fact, they're maybe less dramatic than oriental bittersweet, but there's certainly plants we might want to consider something else in lieu of those. But anyway, go ahead and check up, um, check out NHACC and see what the Lunch and Learn series is. Free, always at 12 noon and always done well before one o'clock. So people can truly um, enjoy those at home. Those are never in person. Those have been online since, since a long time. So um, that's the idea, <laughs> take a break and, and learn something at lunchtime. Okay. I think we've covered everything now. So I'm going to go ahead and say, can I have a motion to end the meeting at this point? <laughs> Check. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye. And thank you to the people carrying on with offices. <laughs> Patrick, you still there? Nope.
Oops. <laughs>